Good afternoon from Lisbon and The Hague, and welcome to the launch of a new report from the EMCDDA and Europol, EU Drug Markets, Key Insights for Policy and Practice. My name is Catherine Robertson. I'm responsible for media relations at the EMCDDA. Today's report wraps up the latest EU drug markets in-depth analysis, which kicked off in May 2022, and it outlines the current drug landscape, emerging threats, and it offers a top-level summary of key findings and actions to increase preparedness. This is the fourth comprehensive overview of the illicit drug market from the two agencies since the first one was launched in 2013. During this press conference, we'll be hearing from three distinguished speakers. Firstly, European Commissioner for Home Affairs, Ms. Ylva Johansson, followed by the Executive Director of Europol, Ms. Catherine de Bull, and finally, the Director of the EMCDDA, Alexi Guzdel. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to give you a few housekeeping details. So after the speeches, you'll be able to submit your questions uh, to the two directors in English. Uh, for this, please, if you could uh, use the Q&A button, so not the chat, but the Q&A button. Um, and as usual, please state your name, your organization, and to whom the question is addressed. Uh, the Q&A will then be moderated by my colleague at Europol, Head of Corporate Communication and Spokesman, Mr. Jan Optengen Ort. Uh, so it is now my pleasure to introduce the first speaker. European Commissioner for Home Affairs, Ms. Ilva Johansson. Thank you. Drugs damage our health and our society. Drugs cause addiction, overdoses, death. And the organized criminal networks that traffic the drugs undermine society with corruption and violence. To counter this dual threat, our two EU agencies are joining forces. Our drugs agency with its expertise on drug markets and Europol with its focus on security. Each doing what they do best, combining efforts and breaking down silos. With the EU drug markets report, which offers key insights for policy and practice based on in-depth analysis and long-standing cooperation between the two agencies. As a policymaker, I rely on the expertise of the drugs agency in Europol. I make my policies based on facts. Like recently, the launch of the European Ports Alliance against drug trafficking, because it takes a network to fight a network. If you are a policymaker, decision maker or practitioner, this report offers a quick overview of what you need to know. With key insights on drug markets, a constantly evolving market worth 30 billion euro in the European Union alone, with huge amounts and many different kinds of drugs available. And with the key developments on individual drugs, cannabis most commonly used, cocaine increasingly used, and synthetic drugs being produced in the EU itself. And the report also outlines actions against drug threats, actions to improve the intelligence picture, to reduce supply, strengthening international cooperation, capacity building, policy and healthcare responses. So I would like to thank Catherine de Ball and Alexis Gustil personally. And I thank Europol and the Drugs Agency for this report. I recommend this report to everyone who is designing or implementing drug policies, be it from the perspective of public health or security. I know it will help you to make a difference. We thank the Commissioner very much for her message. And you can read more about her thoughts on this topic in the forward of today's report. Uh, we'll also make the video available on our website, along with the full recording of this press conference. Uh, so I now have the pleasure to introduce uh, Europol's Executive Director, Ms. Catherine de Bourg. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, colleagues and friends. 
and thank you for your interest in the joint Europol EMCDDA Drug Markets Analysis 2024 Key Insights for Policy and Practice. As the Executive Director of Europol, the European Agency for Law Enforcement Cooperation, I have a special focus on the international criminal drug market. Criminal networks active in the illicit drug market are not any longer an invisible enemy. They have become part of our societies. These networks have a high negative impact on the very core of our communities, weaving through the fabric of our society, our democracies, eroding trust, fueling violence and creating cycles of addiction and poverty. In short, the criminal networks behind the drugs market undermine the stability of our economy, they infiltrate our institutions with corruption, challenge the rule of law, and weaken the social contract that binds us. The omnipresent influence of this enemy needs a vigilant, unified response to safeguard our citizens and society's health. We have to find an answer to this complex problem. And there is a saying that for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong. So what is the right answer to this complex problem? And how complex does it need to be? First, it's important to understand that this is a problem of our societies. Law enforcement has an important role to play, but it is only one part of the solution. This is why the drugs markets analysis looks at both the supply of drugs and the demand or user side. Second, to effectively combat organized crime, we must understand how criminal networks work. Their adaptability and innovation in drug production and trafficking calls for an equally dynamic response from law enforcement, and I will give you three elements for an effective response. First, we need to improve the intelligence picture. This begins with the systematic monitoring and analysis of the criminal networks active in the drugs market. By continuously mapping the most threatening criminal networks and high value targets, we can respond at an earlier stage and allocate our resources more efficiently. Second, we need to strengthen responses to reduce the supply, for example, the trafficking and diversion of essential chemicals used in drug production. And third, we really need to strengthen international law enforcement cooperation, but starting from the bottom. Information on local networks must be shared at national level, and national information must be shared at international level. We need clear, coordinated, horizontal, and vertical approaches. Every local drugs problem is linked to international organized crime. Behind the local cannabis or cocaine dealer is a larger national, but also international network. We must fight the whole chain. The fight against drug trafficking remains an uphill battle and we are not there yet. But we are making progress, and the violence we see on our streets is sometimes linked, linked to this progress. We seize large quantities, we arrest top criminals, and that creates unrest. Local groups fight over territories. But we need to continue, we cannot give up, and we certainly need to focus on those recruited, recruiting young people and minors to become part of the drugs criminal network. For this, 
we must continue to make full use of relevant European tools for operational coordination and international coordination, in particular operational task forces and joint investigation teams. Europol, the organization I have the honor to lead, is the place for this kind of international law enforcement cooperation. We provide a unique platform where EU member states can pool resources, share intelligence, and coordinate operations in real time to combat criminal networks. By leveraging the latest technologies and Europol's network of partners and third countries, such as Ecuador and Colombia, we facilitate the ex exchange of critical information and the support uh, and we support cross-border investigations, making Europol an indispensable hub for safeguarding European and global security. In conclusion, the responsibility that lies with law enforcement in protecting our society, our economy and our democracy is immense. However, through innovation, collaboration, and a relentless pursuit of justice, we can confront the challenges posed by the illicit drug market. For this, we need strong partners, and there is clearly, clearly not a one-dimensional answer to a complex problem. We need a coalition on all levels of society, including the private sector and the economy, creating public-private partnerships such as the re recent initiative on the EU Port Alliance. Let us reaffirm our commitment to these principles today for the safety and for the security of our communities tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madame de Vol. Uh, it's now time to hand over to Alexi Guzdel, uh, the EMCTDA director. Thank you, Alexi, you have the floor. Good afternoon. Hello, Catherine, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very proud to share uh, with you the new drug market report recommendations. Uh, it's the result of a years long partnership together with Europol, uh, but also with the European network of national focal points, RATOX, all the sources of information that we mobilize together to provide a unique strategic analysis of uh, based on the dynamics of the drug market. And uh, why is it important? Because today, more than ever, uh, we, we are confronted with a multifaceted drug market. The illicit drug market is more active and more potent than it has ever been. We have the highest ever availability of substances at uh, always ever cheap prices and high purity. Uh, as Catherine mentioned, uh, we the, the, the drug problem is one of the many globalized phenomena. Uh, it has an impact uh, not only on the EU territory, but everywhere in the world. And uh, the distinction between uh, producing tra countries, trafficking countries, and consuming countries uh, is not uh, yet uh, useful to represent the real situation. Uh, there, there, is a, there are plenty of problems faced by all countries. Uh, both on consumption, production, and trafficking. And the European Union, as said by the Commissioner Johansson, uh, the European Union is itself a worldwide producer for some drugs that are exported as far as uh, to New Zealand or Australia. So that's the complexity of the problem. And uh, due to this uh, unprecedented uh, precedented increase uh, and this elevated uh, drug price and policy ratio, uh, we see, and there is a huge increase in the recent years in the European Union, there is a significant impact on the society, not only on the side of drug use and the harm, drug-related harm and the consequences, but increasingly also drug-related violence that is impacting all the EU member states and that is impacting all the main cities in our countries, while until seven and eight years ago, when at European level we were discussing a strategy on drug-related violence, this was about providing support to Central America. Today, it's part of the daily reality in the European Union. So this call for 
a multidisciplinary, multi-branched approach, including, of course, law enforcement, public health, education, prevention, and international cooperation. And we need a strong framework uh, to, to uh, join forces together with uh, between the EU member states. And this common framework is provided both uh, by the EU policy on drugs, the EU strategy, some of the key tools, uh, including some tools that are not specific, uh, specifically tailored on drugs, but uh, I have a strong drug component. Last week, the ministers of interior uh, gathered in Brussels uh, to discuss the uh, results of the evaluation of Schengen. And part of the evaluation of Schengen, there was a component about drugs and drug trafficking. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a huge priority for all of us. And, and uh, it, it shows that one of the major changes compared with 10 or 20 years ago is the fact that today, if we want to uh, adapt our policies and strategies, as Catherine de Bolle said, we need to join forces between law enforcement and public health and socioeconomic development. Because in fact, if we look at some of the factors that are influencing, playing a role in the development of uh, areas of uh, uh, la lack of control from the law enforcement, but also emergence of new use or people trafficking drugs, it's uh, usually those are areas with the high social and economic vulnerability. And clearly the responses uh, to better address the issues at stake need to have the different component. Clearly with the problem associated with drug related violence in some cities, including in Brussels, the capital of Europe, uh, it's not just with uh, police actions or just with prevention programs. We need to work together to join forces at the international level, as Catherine said, but also at local level, especially bringing all the data, all the information we can have in order to better identify what are the different problems at local level and how to address them together in a more holistic approach, in a more holistic manner. Today, or this year, is a very special year for the EMCDDA because in a few months' time, we are going to transform ourselves into the European Drugs Agency. A new agency, new mandate, broader mandate, more means, but they come with much more responsibilities. One of them is to provide more and better support to the EU and to the member states in partnership with our sister agencies, the first of them uh, being Europol, but with some others like Frontex or uh, ECDC or the European Medicine Agency. We, we want and we need to improve the intelligence picture, not only for the operations, but also for the strategic analysis. And one of the new features and the new services we are going to provide in that matter are two. One is the establishment of a European network of forensic and toxicology laboratories to help detect and monitor much faster any new drug, any new substance that is uh, appearing on the, on the European drugs market. We are going to provide support for more and better threat assessments. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, there is a, a double priority for the EU as stated by the roadmap that was presented by the commissioner a few months ago. And there will be a, a European high level conference on, on crime prevention in Tallinn in April this year. And the second conference that will be dedicated to drug related violence will take place in Brussels. We organize end of November in partnership with the European Commission, Europol and other agencies, the first high level conference on drug related violence because drug related violence is the main problem faced by citizens, by decision makers and by the mayors in many European cities. The, the, the second uh, level uh, of, uh, of support is, is also to provide support, as Catherine said, to supply and, uh, and supply reduction. And uh, there, there was this week a proposal from the Belgian presidency of the EU to uh, further develop and strengthen data collection on drug-related seizures, namely at the external borders of the EU. And of course, the new EUDA welcomes this initiative and will contribute together with Europol because for 30 years now, 
we have developed a standard set of drug supply indicators, we still face a lot of challenges to get timely information from the member states. And there, I can join uh, my voice to the voice and the arguments uh, presented by Catherine to say we need more cooperation, more exchange of information, more and more timely communication between the member states and between the member states and the European agencies. International cooperation is a very important uh, component. Uh, it was uh, the Commissioner and the Minister uh, of Interior of Belgium, Mrs. Annelise Verlinden, have paid the visit to uh, the port of Antwerp. We supported the visit, we attended the visit together with Europol, but they also paid the visit to uh, Ecuador and to Colombia. Europol and the EUDA uh, have a, a partnership, have cooperation, and myself, I will uh, travel in May to uh, Bogota to sign a bilateral working agreement uh, with Colombia, not only to exchange information, but also to learn what are the changes even in the production processes, in the way drugs are being produced, not only in the way they are uh, smuggled to, uh, through Europe. Uh, finally, uh, a very important air area is uh, investing in capacity building. And there uh, we, we cooperate with Europol, but also with the European College of Police, CEPOL, uh, to, uh, to train police officers to provide support. And in our case, one of the new services or augmented services, a graded service we will produce and provide to the member states and the practitioners is a European drug alert system. One of the features of such a system uh, will be, as we did already some years ago together with Europol, we produced a special safety and security briefing for professionals from the law enforcement forces, being police or customs, how to detect and how to behave when they detect su suspect powders that can be, in some cases, very potent synthetic opioids. Uh, some of them, just in contact with the skin, could uh, cause up to uh, uh, until uh, an overdose, uh, an acute intoxication. So there is a need to help protect the law enforcement professionals and to give uh, adequate information and the tools to make their intervention while being and remaining safe. We need also to, uh, to improve and to further invest, as uh, highlighted by the commissioner, in public health and public health interventions I remember a meeting we had a few months ago to be, together with Catherine, and, uh, and uh, Catherine de Bol was saying, OK, we, we do everything we can uh, to fight against organized criminal groups, but we, we should find a way to have uh, more and better prevention, because people who are consuming, well, even if it is not their intention, well, they contribute to the market, even if today the market is clearly driven by the offer of drugs and not by the consumers. So a key message for us is it's no time to launch a fight against drugs or against consumers. It's a fight against a fight in order to protect our citizens and protect everyone in the European Union. Certainly, it, it means that we will need to update, to change, to adapt prevention, treatment and harm reduction interventions to the new needs that are and the new harms that are caused by those new substances or those new combination of substances. So what, what in a nutshell the, the report is showing, and, uh, and you have more detail for each group, main group of substances uh, in the report, what we see is that this, there is a huge complexity, even more than it was five or 10 years ago. And in essence, it is changing drugs, the behaviors, trafficking, the behavior at local level, including the fight between uh, the local criminal groups. And this means that it's time to keep the strategy, but to broaden and update the analysis on the basis of new and in the future, the new data that we still don't have and that are absolutely necessary to help the EU, the member states and the cities, for instance, to better protect the citizens and guarantee the security, the safety, and the health, at the end, the human development of all our citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexi.
Uh, so now it's time to hand over to my colleague in Europol, to Jan, who will now um, take care of the Q&A and the moderation of the rest of the press conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you, Director Gustil. Thank you, Exif Director De Bolle. Welcome to everybody from Europol's headquarters in the City of Peace and Justice, The Hague in the Netherlands. The questions are coming in. Uh, some are more general, some are more detailed. I would say we go from the more general to the more detailed to ensure that the majority of followers have an interest in uh, uh, the directors and principals to answer. First question, uh, it's not clear to whom it's directed. So I would say maybe for both from different angles, so XRF Director De Bolle and Director Gustel, how significant would you, from your distinctive perspective, say is the impact of the drug market in general in the EU? Yes, uh, maybe I can start and then, uh, Alexi, you can uh, continue. So um, the illicit uh, drug market is still the largest uh, market. And what do we see in the EU at the moment? We see that the last years we have been confronted to an increase of cocaine uh, trafficking in the last years. What we also see is synthetic drugs, synthetic drugs are increasing. Um, we, have, uh, we are confronted uh, to fentanyl, to Trank, to uh, Nitazines in um, the EU. And uh, so we also see that the EU is a production uh, area uh, for drugs. Um, and we also see that um, cannabis remains one of the most important uh, uh, drugs that is consumed and produced in the EU. Um, what we also see is that criminal groups active in the illicit uh, drugs market, they are very resilient because even with all the crises we have known, like uh, the uh, COVID crisis, like the war in Ukraine, now uh, the situation in Afghanistan, the drugs market uh, stayed active and the criminal groups, they did show that they were resilient, that they are resilient uh, to this global crisis, to this instability, to the economic changes uh, we have gone through uh, with uh, the European Union. Um, as Alexi also mentioned, we are confronted with criminal groups. Um, the drug business is a very profitable business. So we see that there is a lot of, uh, in fact, a key feature for criminal groups is the usage of violence. We even did found torture rooms in the EU now. This is what we have never seen this before. This is was this was used in uh, Latin America, but not in the EU. We also see and we underestimated, in fact, the impact of and the usage of corruption uh, by criminal organizations and all the attempts uh, to infiltration of uh, criminal groups in the legal society. Um, the big issue we are confronted with at the moment is that we see that criminal groups are recruiting young people, young people to um, make them an active member of the criminal group young people who are then uh, tasked to killings, to commit killings. And what we also see, and what is really destabilizing uh, the social network, the social contract, undermining the rule of law and undermining trust in society is that whole families are living from the income they get through young people working for criminal groups. So we see that the dependency from families um, on the income of criminal groups is growing and is increasing. And that is really an area we have to work on. And that is why I say that we really need a multidisciplinary approach and we really need to do more uh, together with other services like inspection services of um, ed education, health services, um, uh, the community uh, services that are alre already working in uh, different uh, environments. Well, that was a, a very comprehensive answer. I, I, I fully support what Catherine said. I, I would add uh, one uh, very interesting example. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the the in the investigation around Sky ECC operation, and uh, what what I think is extremely interesting is the fact that. Uh, 
thanks to the, the huge amount of information that was collected through that operation, we, we see that the uh, law enforcement forces, they are dismantling stock stockpiles, uh, laboratories everywhere in Europe. And, and what I find interesting is that most of the people, they are so surprised because in a small city in Wallonia, they realized there was such a, there were tons of, uh, of uh, uh, cannabis that were uh, in, a, in a house or, or in a, uh, another place. And, uh, and for me, it's important because it shows, it illustrates what together with Europol we say for years, is that it's not because people were not anymore dying from overdose in the streets that the drug problem has disappeared. And, and what SkyCC is showing, and in its way also the huge increase in the availability of cocaine and the fight for controlling the market, the cocaine market, but also the cannabis market, is the fact that those operations show how widespread it is all over our society, which means that nobody can pretend that there is no drug, that there is no risk for the citizens. We know that uh, there is a pressure, the, the, the very aggressive marketing methods. Um, it, it, uh, it really shows that uh, uh, even for people who were not used uh, to use drugs, uh, they, there is a much more exposure. And uh, we have already mentioned uh, during the COVID pandemic that uh, one of the negative effects from the pandemic and from the measures that we, governments needed to take is the fact that uh, there was a negative impact on mental health in the population, uh, on the already vulnerable uh, groups in the society. Uh, and those groups, uh, either through participation of uh, the youngest, uh, the youngest member in some criminal uh, organizations, for instance, uh, uh, working for drug dealers or drug traffickers, uh, like few few weeks ago, a uh, few months ago in Marseille, uh, there was a young uh, a teenager that uh, came to Marseille to find a job on the drug field. He started doing the surveillance at 2 p.m. At six, he was dead. And that that was a very it's one of many shocking examples that, uh, as Catherine says. Uh, for some people, it, it's even considered like a, a, a job opportunity if there is nothing else. And, and our problem today is uh, to move towards less fragmented policies, more holistic, more, more comprehensive, to support also social development. Because when we speak about uh, useful or fruitful interventions uh, for crime prevention, it's in the community. If we discuss about uh, uh, innovative or uh, interesting methods for prevention, it's also community interventions. And what we see is that today, those who are in the front line and are extremely exposed to all the problems and struggling to find comprehensive solutions, they are the mayors of the cities. And this is why uh, we look forward to the, the meeting, the conference of the European Forum on Urban Security that will take place in Brussels uh, in two weeks from now, uh, where we will have a rich opportunity for exchanges because those mayors, they are alone, they feel alone in front of a situation that may go out of control. And therefore, this is a, a very concrete illustration that uh, we need to join forces and that all actors have a role to play. Like when the mayor of Athens decided to open a drug consumption room, he met with the habitants of the neighborhood where there was open scene and where there was drug de dealing and consumption. And his commitment was also to provide, again, public services from the municipality to an area that was socially deprived. And I think it's very simple illustration that just one intervention is not enough. It's not enough to provide the place for safe consumption that can help address some part of the problem if we, we cannot guarantee the safety of the citizens, if they are not, again, public services provided to them like to any other citizen. So it shows how, how big is the challenge because it's not only about having more money for treatment or for the police. Is, uh, is to have a common and joint long-term investment for social development in all cities and in all countries. Thank you.
I think this question also answered a little bit uh, the questions that are coming on violence. There's a lot of questions on violence. Uh, two follow-up questions, maybe one for Alexis Gustel immediately on cooperation with countries like Colombia, Peru and Bolivia are mentioned. Mm -hmm. You already mentioned Colombia that you go to Bogota uh, soon, but maybe you would like to elaborate more on that. And then maybe a follow-up question for Director De Bolo on why are the numbers of seizures going up from Max Ramsey from Bloomberg News. But uh, if Alexis wants to speak on seizures, why are it so high, please, uh, also for you. But maybe we start with Col Colombia, Peru, Bolivia for Alexis Gustel. Okay, Jan, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I will avoid uh, to answer to the second part of the question because I'm sure uh, Catherine will do very well and even better than me. Uh, uh, for the first question, I, I think what is interesting is that there is a cooperation between the EU and Latin American countries for more than 30 years, 35 years. Uh, the, first, uh, the first strategy of the EU uh, towards non-EU countries or regions was the EU strategy uh, on drugs in Latin America or with Latin America that was adopted in 89. Uh, but the truth is that uh, uh, in the recent years, the, that cooperation has been uh, strengthening. Uh, and one of the, the examples was that uh, for 12 or 14 years ago now, a bi-regional program called COPOLAT uh, was uh, uh, established and was created, uh, gathering, uh, fostering cooperation and coordination between the countries in Latin America, between the countries in the EU, and between the two, uh, the two regions uh, with different components uh, that were not only covering law enforcement, but uh, the building and development of national drug observatories, but also prevention program or training of the law enforcement forces. So what, what we can say is that uh, with, with the, the huge and quick and rapid evolution of, uh, uh, first of all, the yield in the production of coca and cocaine in Latin America, even if in some cases, we start detecting laboratories on the EU territory that make the last chemical phase of the transformation. But this increase in the availability and smuggling of cocaine that I think is at least partly combined with the fact that there is kind of a saturation of the American market, given the huge consumption and the huge quantities that have been smuggled in the last 30, 40 years, and that are unfortunately glamorized by some TV series uh, that you can see on the internet, um, reaching the point that uh, in Colombia, uh, you have people who were uh, uh, tourists that were going to Medellin to have pictures taken together with the lieutenant of uh, Pablo Escobar, which was not really welcomed by the Colombian citizens, as you can imagine. So the evolution brings now uh, uh, new needs and also a new willingness, new interest in, in having a closer cooperation, not only with Colombia or Ecuador, uh, as uh, you rightly mentioned, uh, uh, we, we also have a cooperation with Peru. Uh, we have a bilateral agreement with them. Uh, we had the official visit uh, in, in Peru last October. Uh, I think both, all, all countries in Latin America, uh, they, they really want to be part of the partnership. And, and, and uh, one of the worries for some of them is, the, is not to remain excluded from new forms of cooperation. For instance, working group on the ports from the EU and Latin America. Also, there are new risks, like uh, in Peru, there is a new port built with uh, uh, Chinese funds uh, that will be the entry door of all Chinese products, so potentially NPS or chemical precursors to Latin America. So those countries more than ever uh, need to have a cooperation, a strengthened cooperation with the EU. But at the same time, I think what they express is that uh, there is a need to be to reinvent and to be more innovative uh, uh, for the cooperation also on human development. And, and I think that's certainly an important point. Uh, uh, fight to fight against uh, drug production and trafficking, uh, uh, it's not only about controlling the ports. Certainly we have, they, they and we have huge challenges talking about uh, control in the ports, being in the in Latin America or in Europe, but it's about human development. 
And we see that uh, in countries, there are countries there where the situation is really out of control. Uh, and, and it combines or it accumulates so many human, social, and economic factors that it really gives a highway for organized criminal groups to operate. The problem being when they are completely, when they have completely infiltrated the society, it's extremely difficult to come back and to reinstall the, the rule of law. And there also a country like Colombia that have faced a huge, uh, almost uncontrollable situation 34 years ago, they managed to reinstall the, the rule of law. Uh, there is uh, economic progress and development. Uh, and, and, and today, they may be still organized criminal group active. Certainly, there are laboratories. Um, but that's a, that's a society, that's a country that is partner of the EU and needs further support. So uh, we are going to continue. We have also an agreement in, in negotiation that is soon to be approved with the Chile. Uh, but, but the important is that this, this cooperation uh, is shared uh, as uh, Europol is doing, like uh, the, the, the partnership, the, the European uh, Port Alliance Private Public Partnership, and also other groups, other activities, uh, because um, they, are, they are also better equipped, uh, at least in some of the countries, to establish this cooperation. But we need also to continue to build trust. Uh, I think, as far as I know, for the colleagues from Europol, for instance, exchanging safely information and making sure that the confidential information will not end up in the hands of criminal organized group is a precondition to be able to exchange information. And still we have uh, problems to make in that area also. Thank you, Director Gustil. We have 24 questions still unanswered, so I will try to summarize a, a few. But the next question would be for Director, Executive Director De Bolle. Why are the seizures are going up every year, one record year after the other? Why so many seizures? Um, I could simply say that's because law enforcement uh, officers are working very hard on a daily basis. That's 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 certainly one part uh, of the of the of the answer. But what is very important is that we have a good intelligence picture, and I must say that the last yes, all the law enforcement agencies and also uh, the team of Alexis, we were really working on a good um, intelligence um, uh, on good intelligence. We need to have a good picture on the situation of drugs in the EU, and this intelligence picture. Um, is much better than before. Um, and this gives us the opportunity to align our um, uh, resources and to align our approach. Um, we have not only intelligence in who the criminal networks are, but also in what is their modus operandi, what are the routes uh, they are using. We, we even have a good view on the changes in the routes. Now, for instance, uh, from Latin America, uh, the drugs transported uh, to the United to the European Union are passed by uh, through the West African uh, coasts. Um, so it's uh, important for our investigations uh, to have this good intelligence picture. And this is also thanks to uh, the encrypted platforms that we were able uh, to look at and that gave us, in fact, unprecedented insights in how uh, serious and organized crime organize their business. Uh, we saw that um, they use crime as a service. We saw who are behind um, these networks, who are the high-value targets. We saw uh, we had good insights in how they, they launder their money. And uh, we also had a good insight in the infrastructure they use uh, for their business. And uh, this led uh, to much more seizures in the European uh, Union, much more arrests linked uh, to these investigations. Um, we have to continue that way. That is why we are also currently working on a mapping exercise to have a view of, for the whole European Union or which are the most threatening criminal networks for the European Union. This will also give us the opportunity uh, to allocate our resources where they are needed from a European perspective and from a national perspective. Thank you for your reply, Executive Director De Bolle. There are three questions on synthetic drugs. 
So I expect the majority is interested in synthetic drugs. Also good question for both speakers. Uh, so European Union as a production continent for synthetic drugs, is there a rise in synthetic drugs? Which synthetic drugs are you concerned about? Maybe we we, we continue quickly with executive director De Bolle and then we give the floor to director Gustiel on synthetic drugs. Yes, synthetic drugs are produced at an industrial, industrial scale, in fact, in the European Union. We know that um, the countries that are most affected are the Netherlands, Belgium and Poland. Uh, they are key production areas. It's a serious concern, of course, uh, for the law enforcement community and for the society. We have more and more reports about this so-called zombie drug that increased. Um, more than 70,000 people lost their life, lives related already uh, to the zombie drugs in the United States. And um, in the uh, European Union, we are confronted with uh, xizaline, xilazine, uh, that is also mixed with uh, ketamine, synthetic opioids or heroin. Um, recently, uh, we did produce a report on trunk uh, to all the partners, and we keep we will keep uh, monitoring uh, this situation. And maybe you have heard already about uh, flaca. This is uh, also a new synthetic drug we see. What we also see in the European Union is that new drugs are uh, made, new synthetic uh, products, illegal products are put on the market on a small scale in a small city. Uh, there is an, an organized group behind, and then they look at uh, the consequences of putting this product on the market. Is it um, uh, profit? Do they have profit uh, out of that, or don't they have profit out of that? This is, for instance, what happened also with Flaca in some small cities, and it really has a very nefast input in. Um, influence on the on the human behavior it is a cheap uh, drug and it's a very dangerous uh, drug it is extremely addictive so we are very worried about all these new types of synthetic drugs that we find uh, on a very regular basis uh, in the european uh, streets yes uh, thank you katrin uh, just to to complement uh, I, I think uh, I had an interesting discussion in Brussels with some colleagues uh, a few days ago, and I, I was uh, surprised that the scientific-based information we share is not always easy to understand. Uh, at least it, it's it's uh, my experience. So uh, here, to say simply, we have two two categories, two group of substances that are synthetic. One is the more one are the one group is uh, made of the more classical ones, amphetamines methamphetamines, uh, ecstasy. Uh, uh, European Union is a worldwide producer and exporter of ecstasy. Um, we have uh, uh, industrial capacity of product. We, we have discovered in Europe uh, more than 430 or 450 laboratories, uh, with the, some of them with the industrial capacity of production for those substances. Luckily, uh, for the moment, those substances, there seems to be more for export to other regions of the world. Uh, we don't observe yet an increase in the use, uh, at least a strong in, there is no strong increase in the use of cocaine or methamphetamines. Uh, still, when we speak about methamphetamine, what is also extremely worrying is uh, the observation we shared with, uh, uh, we received from Europol uh, that, uh, that uh, in those cases, uh, the, the chemists, the cooks, Either they are Mexican or they are following the production methods uh, that are uh, typical of the Mexican cartels. And we know from information we receive, for instance, from uh, from the DEA, that uh, it seems that the Mexican cartels have a, have a strategy or an objective to to control that market worldwide. So the fact that now we find some of those cooks uh, involved in, uh, in uh, laboratories that have been dismantled and the production in Europe is worrying. Then there is a, a second group of substances that are called the new psychoactive substances. Uh, they are all chemical, so they are all synthetic. Uh, we have a special system, uh, an early warning system uh, to detect and alert on those uh, substances uh, that is uh, working since 97. That's a system we operate together with Europol. 
Um, just to give you an, an order of importance, so until two, three years ago, we were uh, detecting one new substance that never appeared ever on the European market. There was one new substance per week. For the moment, we are one new substance every two weeks, more or less. Um, over the last 27 years, we have detected 950 new substances. Some of them have stayed in the market. Those, uh, some others have disappeared. But uh, last year, uh, we had uh, more than 400 of those substances who appeared here and there uh, somewhere on the European market. Uh, and some of them uh, uh, just were detected through police or the customs or because uh, of some uh, acute cases of intoxication. What, what uh, is a frequent question we receive is about fentanyls. So to explain what is fentanyl, it's, it's very simple. Uh, they belong to synthetic opioids and the synthetic opioids, they are chemical, purely chemical molecules that mimic the structure of, uh, of uh, heroin and other opioids that are coming from opium. So I would say they are from uh, vegetal origin. They act at the level of the same receptors in the brain, but they don't have the same properties. And many of those substances, nobody knows their properties, which means nobody, some of them, they are very potent. They, they can kill very quickly. And of course, those who produce and smuggle them and smell and sell them uh, are not aware of uh, uh, the toxicity or, or the possible effect. So um, the, the, the fentanyls, they appeared on the drug market 12 years ago. So it's not as recent as it is in the US. And those substances, they mostly come from China. And increasingly, in the recent year, part of them is coming from India. Still, the main bulk so far was coming from China. And China is also exporting to the EU uh, a lot of chemicals and chemical precursors that are used to produce other substances. So that's, that's a direct threat on the European market. So the frequent question we receive is, uh, are we going, there, there is a problem, in a huge problem in the US, more or less 120,000 people, 140,000 people dying every year from overdose, from opiates and essentially from fentanyl. And uh, there is, of course, a, a worry, a concern that we could be one day invaded a bit later after the US by those fentanyl. What we have done, the analysis we have conducted all the day on the basis of all the data, those collected by Europol and the data collected by us, show that for the moment there is not such a risk. Why? First, because the first wave of fentanyl arrived in the context of the new psychoactive substances. They are still appearing, but also this group of synthetic opioids is changing because, as Catherine described very well, well, the producer and the trafficker, they, they try, they test some substances. Uh, some of them, they are being put under control at European level, thanks to our early warning system and the contribution of our work. So they try and change for other substances. But there are plenty of different categories of synthetic opioids. So uh, today, uh, as Catherine said, we see another group of molecules that are synthetic opioids that are the nitazines. So that's one of the reasons why nobody can predict that there will be a huge wave of fentanyl arriving in one year or two years in Europe. There is one caveat, which is that uh, last year, the Taliban in Afghanistan, the government of the Taliban has put the production of opium uh, under control. It has been prohibited by the Taliban. And, and the satellite imaging shows that at least in big provinces where there is a huge production of, uh, of poppy, like in Helmand, this uh, ban has uh, an impact, an effect, uh, 95, 98%. This means that if it continues to be banned and controlled as it is for the moment, one day, this means that there will be a drought of heroin and of uh, natural opioids on the territory of the European Union. And then, as it has been the case already 20 years ago with the previous government of the Taliban in Afghanistan, there may be changes on the drug market. And certainly the, there is a major risk that where people were using heroin, but the heroin market represents 
17% of the uh, total estimated value of the market today. So it's not the only drugs and it's not everybody that is using synthetic opioids. But among those who use heroin, they certainly will be pushed because of the drought to change their behavior, to change substance and to change the route of administration. This is why we emitted and we provided the member states and the commission and the council with the recommendations, and some of them are very simple. It's not the moment to reduce the investment in the offer for treatment, for prevention, and for harm reduction interventions, including uh, naloxone. It's extremely important because the only medicine, the only drug that can save lives is naloxone. But with those new substances, those new synthetic opioids that are much stronger, basically, the simple administration of naloxone is not enough. And this is why we are going in the coming months to, to continue to monitor together with the Europol to monitor the situation and to provide or produce together with the member states a new risk communication when needed and a new information about what are the, the updates that it would be useful to make, for instance, for the legislation allowing for the provision of naloxone to, to make sure that if and when there is a widespread use of new synthetic opioids, that the system in place for treatment and responses in the member states will be ready, uh, already in advance, ready to cope and to address the situation. Thank you, Director Gustier. We are slowly coming, reaching 4 p.m., uh, uh, respectively 3 p.m. in Lisbon. So I would say two last questions I try to summarize, and I would also like to give the opportunity to both principals to have some closing remarks in case there's something they would like to say, which hasn't been requested yet. So maybe summarize, there are a number of questions um, on the organized crime gangs behind, um, their questions on Albanians, their question on Mexicans, but Let's let's not look into nationalities. Maybe a question for XF Director De Bolle. Is there, is there an understanding of the crime groups which are active, the networks behind? And maybe a, a summarizing question for Director Gustel. There are some questions on uh, legalizing, regulating, uh, um, what to do with substance abuse. So more this, this, this angle. Um, different questions, so maybe something you would like to elaborate on. And I would like to give both principals also the possibility to have some closing remarks. So maybe let's start with Executive Director De Bolle on the criminal groups behind, and then we move over to Director Goosedale on legalizing, regulating the drug market. Yes, uh, the criminal groups uh, behind uh, the EU drug market is very diverse very flexible, very adapt um, adaptable. Um, they uh, are exploiting, in fact, the legal businesses to do their business. Uh, they use uh, the opportunities offered by the digital economy uh, to make use of, use of cryptocurrencies um, for their payments. Uh, they are active in the dark market uh, area. Um, what we also see is that criminals uh, rely on other criminals um, to expand their network, to expand their network, or to uh, they rely on brokers, which give them the flexibility to diversify the sources, the products, the trafficking lines, the concealment methods, and everything, and which increases their efficiency, of course. From Europol, uh, together with the Belgian presidency and with the Commission, we are looking at. Uh, these criminal networks that are um, the most uh, threatening, that are mostly threatening the European uh, internal security. Um, we came at the moment already to 800, 800 groups, criminal groups, that are a real threat to the internal security in the European Union. I would invite you uh, for the press conference on the 3rd of April. There will we, we will explain uh, how these criminal groups work, who these criminal groups are, and the information is very relevant because we consulted uh, not only the 27 member states, but also uh, third uh, countries and third parties uh, that are active in uh, the fight against uh, serious and organized crime. 
Um, the size of these groups is different. The nationalities of different are different, but we will uh, be able uh, to explain you uh, that. Uh, regarding uh, the the new initiatives re, uh, concerning the possibility to to regulate a market like uh, the cannabis policy, possible changes at European level, uh, let me let me first explain that. Uh, uh, if we compare with other countries and other regions uh, in the world, uh, I think one of the characteristics uh, in Europe for those countries like Germany, Luxembourg, Malta, the Netherlands or, or Czech Republic that are considering uh, some legislative initially initiatives to regulate the market. First of all, the approach is not the same for all those countries in the EU. That's the first point. Uh, the second is certainly uh, the the uh, something they have in common in we have in common in Europe compared with other regions of the world like in the US is that uh, if one day there is a more widespread uh, mo model for regulating this will certainly well I think really certainly not be a model that is just self-regulated by the market first of all because we know that uh, 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 talking about self-regulation of uh, capitalism actually is not true. And uh, the, the economists know well, very well, uh, that uh, uh, the markets are never regulating themselves. This is hence the importance of the public authority. And, and certainly in Europe, uh, that, that's something that would remain. And therefore, uh, the second point is uh, uh, there are different options. And, uh, and the, the main, the first question is what is the objective uh, that is uh, uh, driving uh, the initiative, the new legislative initiative. Um, what, what we see, for instance, in countries like Canada, uh, and uh, if for those of you who are interested, we have a few publications and analysis that we have developed, uh, uh, including on the cannabis policy in the Americas on the website of the MCDDA. What you can see is in Canada, there is a role for the state and there is a priority that is given to public health. Um, here uh, in Europe, what we see is that uh, uh, the, the different uh, projects, uh, they, they, they had a different starting point. Uh, some of them are reaching, have reached more or less the same conclusion. If you look at uh, what is the practice in Malta or in Luxembourg or the recent decision in, in Germany, it's much more reduced than what was initially announced. Uh, one of the reasons is that the EU member states have agreed and decide on the set of common rules, uh, some of them uh, in the context of Schengen or the, the marché unique, the common market, uh, which means that uh, they, they define themselves the rules that would make uh, very difficult, difficult to commercialize, for instance, uh, to allow for uh, commercialization of cannabis and cannabis product. And of course, when I speak about a regulated market, I don't speak about medical use of cannabis and cannabinoids because that's another that's another topic and that's a, another discussion. So for the moment, what, what we can say is even we, for the countries that have not taken uh, some new legislative initiatives, uh, the, the focus in the last 20, 25 years, almost 30 years, was uh, certainly to, even if the legal systems are different and if the legislations are different, the, the approach was to avoid, for instance, to put uh, people in jail just because of single use or simple use of cannabis. It doesn't mean that in some countries uh, there is no policy of harassment uh, of, uh, of the simple cannabis user. This happens. It has happened in the past. Um, uh, but if we, if, we, if we listen to the field, the actors from the field, whether they are from law enforcement or for health or, or uh, social sanitary sector, uh, I think the, the, the approach is, and one of the intentions behind some of those proposals is to, to try to cut the access to the market to criminal organized groups. And, and the second is uh, to make sure that uh, there is in one way or in another, a way to decriminalize the, the use, um, at least if there are no uh, Ill illegal activities or crimes, criminal activities, and also, uh, uh, as it is the case in the Netherlands, the the the, the pilot project uh, that are covering only a few municipalities is uh, is a test 
uh, that was launched by the authorities in order to see how could be addressed the problem of the back door of the coffee shops, uh, for which there is a tolerance, but the coffee shop in the current system, well, the only way for them to acquire cannabis is to buy it uh, to 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 buy illicit cannabis and to buy it to criminal organized groups. So, but again, that's a social experiment. There will be an evaluation, and what I can say is that uh, the MCDDA and soon the EUDA is providing, is first of all, closely monitoring, following uh, uh, those, those new developments, not only the, in the EU, but for instance, in the Americas. And as far as the EU is concerned, we are providing support to the member states that are planning or discussing some of those initiatives. We are helping them to work on what could be possible indicators for the evaluation. I think the one of the biggest challenges uh, for those uh, legislative changes, whether the existing ones or in the future, is to be clear on what is the objective. The second challenge is to make sure that uh, what is decided as a change to lead to the expected results. And then the third element is to put in place the conditions to make uh, a clear evaluation. And for instance, we know that, uh, for instance, in some states in the US, the, 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 there are no robust data uh, for the evaluation. Uh, just the fact that in some states, the private sector has invested 10 or 15 billions of dollars. Nobody can seriously pretend that private sector invests such a big amount of money to lose clients and, and, and to go bankrupt. Uh, this means that uh, uh, the objective cannot be or, or, or those who initiate those projects cannot pretend the objective is to reduce cannabis use. You, you can propose to have a safer cannabis use. You, you can make sure that there are no pesticides. You can uh, reduce the risk for high overdosing or too high concentration in THC. There, there may be different uh, possible and viable objectives, but to present that since the legalization, people have reduced their consumption is not working like that. And, and that's one of the challenges that the EU member states who are considering or who took measures recently, they are all investing time and resources uh, to closely uh, assess what was the situation before they took some new measures and to, to develop an evaluation mechanism that will allow in a few years from now uh, to have a most robust possible scientific evidence about what has been working and what has not been working in the same way that, for instance, in Canada, Canada is a country that has a very strong experience in the evaluation of public policies. Uh, there, there was a, a report published recently uh, that, that indicates some results, some, some, some results that were not expected or some difficulties that have appeared. It doesn't mean that the entire system needs to be changed, but it needs to be adapted. And I think that's one of the things we are going to observe with the challenge, of course, that is uh, mentioned by many member states, especially those who are neighbors of those who have decided to regulate at least partly the cannabis market, is that uh, uh, the, the neighbors that do not follow the same approach have some concerns and some questions about what could be the likely impact. But it's, it's part of what we are supposed to study and to follow. And that's a very important and interesting experience for us to follow. Thank you very much, Director Gustil. Uh, any very quick final remarks from your side in general? Or otherwise, I would give the floor for final remarks to Director De Bolle. Um, I'm happy to give the floor to Director De Bolle. All right. And Catherine de Ball, except our viewer poll, final remarks from your side, and then we are closing the yes. call. Yes. Thank you, Alexi. Um, I think we, we all want to take the safety and the security of our communities as very serious business. And I agree completely with Alexis when he's talking about this multidisciplinary approach. And we need this multidisciplinary approach to confront the challenges of the illegal drugs market. We have to look at the user side. We have to look at the supply chain of the drugs. And we have to do this together with uh, the society and with the different actors in the society. 
I know it's an uphill battle. And I know that a lot of people are discouraged by um, sometimes they think that they don't have enough impact in what they do, but we cannot give up. And we have to continue um, in this approach uh, together. And uh, we have a responsibility, we all have a responsibility related to the safety and the security of the citizens uh, in the, the European Union. As law enforcement community, I can say that we stand ready. We continue uh, to fight against uh, illegal, uh, the, the illicit drugs market, and we will continue to do so together with the partners. Thank you very much, Executive Director De Bolle. Then we're coming to an end. For those that would like to follow those two agencies, as has been communicated, uh, the MCDDA will be soon the European Union Drug Agency. So keep your eyes open for communication from our sister agency in Lisbon. For those interested in a criminal mapping exercise, uh, as Director de Bolle announced, a press conference on the 3rd of April in Brussels on the 900 uh, identified drugs uh, uh, criminal groups in Europe. From uh, the Hague Europol headquarters, thank you for your attention. I don't know if I give back to Cathy in Lisbon. Otherwise, from Europol side, thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you to both principals for the insights and a good afternoon to everybody. Thank you very much, Jan, and we can close now. Thank you to everybody. Bye.